everyone. Welcome to the Carolina Weather Group. This is the Wednesday, July 25th, 2018 edition of our little weather podcast. And we're happy to have you on this um, summer afternoon, evening. I know a lot of you guys here in the Southeast, especially if you're listening from the Southeast, seeing uh, numerous showers and thunderstorms throughout the last few days. And uh, we'll talk about those here in just a little bit. But tonight we're going to be talking about volcanoes. We have Dr. Janine Kreitner on with us. She's from the Con from West Virginia at uh, teaches at Concord University and happy to have uh, Janine on. She is a expert in her field and uh, really likes to talk about the communication factors of volcanoes and what's good and what's maybe bad. I'm sure, uh, especially with the uh, volcano in Hawaii, uh, being in the news over the past couple of months, you've heard some good stuff and maybe some not so good stuff. So uh, Janine will be joining us tonight to kind of decipher through that information and, and uh, learn a lot uh, more about the true facts of volcanoes. So happy to have her with us. If you are watching tonight, uh, this is a live broadcast, so we'd love to have your interaction with us. We are streaming right now on Facebook Live and Periscope and also on our YouTube page. Uh, and if you want to um, send any questions or comments, please uh, do that. The best way to do that is on Twitter at Carolina WX Group. That's the best way to uh, to interact with us. But you can also comment on the Perico Periscope stream or the Facebook live stream or the YouTube page, and we'll monitor those as well. And if you're listening on the podcast version, uh, we'll let uh, Dr. Kreitner join, uh, share her social media information uh, towards the end of the show. That way, if you have any specific questions, you can direct those her way. So that is what we are talking about tonight. Looks like we have a, a pretty full panel tonight. We know Ashley's off on assignment and Ricky is up in Oshkosh, Wisconsin at the air show. But I think everybody else is here tonight except Peter. And Peter said that his uh, computer was doing an update. So hopefully Peter will be able to join us here in just a little bit. So with that, I do want to bring uh, want to bring to everyone's attention who's watching or listening tonight. We have added a new panelist. Uh, you may have uh, seen Christopher Jackson on with us. <laughs> over the weekend as uh, we were chasing and, and talking about some severe storms. But Christopher is uh, in the Columbia, South Carolina area. We've been on uh, doing this for five years and we've really not had any representation from the Columbia area. So um, we're happy to have Christopher joining us. And I know Christopher's uh, sent a lot of new followers and, and viewers our way. So Christopher, welcome to the team. And uh, we kind of just threw you out with the wolves there over the weekend. Tell us about uh, this weekend's adventures for you. Oh, I was glad to be here, guys, and uh, absolutely, uh, this weekend was pretty fun. Nice little uh, chase into the uh, South Carolina upstate, uh, I guess, uh, south of the Fair Play, northwest of Anderson, along the eastern shores of Lake Hartwell. Uh, followed a nice little storm for about an hour and a half, uh, two hours maybe, and watched it uh, attempt to cycle through uh, two, or two or three different uh, evolutions, trying to produce a, a, a weak wall cloud. And in the end, uh, you know, as the sun started to go down, it just uh, kind of lost a lot of its forcing. And, and we can uh, pretty quick. <clears throat> it's been fun though. Yeah, you got a, a really nice picture of a just a, an amazing shelf cloud. And yeah, uh, that, that was that was a great shot. Uh, yeah, that was Monday afternoon, I believe, over the Harvison area. That was a nice little uh, severe thunderstorm that developed over the Lexington, moved uh, up to the northeast across, I guess, the far eastern end of Lake Murray, then over into the Irmo area. I was happening to go and uh, get lunch over in that area and just. Uh, happened to stumble up on up on it, so it worked out. Well, Christopher, we uh, appreciate uh, you joining us, and happy to have you here in our panelists. And uh, we look forward to more storm chases and more uh, good information coming out of the Columbia, South Carolina area. Um, let's travel up Interstate 77 per se. Let's uh, go up to Charlotte, North Carolina. We'll bring in James Briarton. James, how are things going there with you and baby uh, Theo? I see him. We are we are doing just fine. He just had a bottle, uh, so he is a happy camper. And uh, you know, a third, fourth straight day of thunderstorms here seems like every day delivered for the most part. Uh, keeping a close eye on those creeks here in Charlotte because, as you know, they run right through the heart of the city. So we um, we didn't get any sort of flash flooding, but we did have several flood advisories. But I know other parts of North Carolina and and South Carolina were dealing with some isolated events of flash flooding because of those uh, scattered storms. But otherwise, uh, not much to report. Just kind of. You know, taking it day by day. All right, James, we appreciate that report from the Queen City. Let's go down to um, – we'll go down to Charleston, South Carolina. We'll bring in Jared, and then uh, I'll let Shay come in towards the end to do the tropics talk. But, uh, Jared, you guys also dealing with showers and thunderstorms, it seems like. 
Yeah, off and on. Just, uh, I, I just want to just want them to happen at a reasonable hour so I can get some sleep. Um, it, it, it's. It, can we just ask for that? Um, a lot of people have been woken up by some loud thunder um, and some bright flash, flashes of lightning and some uh, flooding. We had a flood event uh, last Friday. Um, put good pit of the city underwater for a few hours. Um, rain at low tide. Uh, four or five inches in the most vulnerable spots of downtown. So uh, that's been fun. Uh, but yeah, so we're just watching some more showers and storms with that really weird. Uh, what what month is it? Is it July or is it December? Like we shouldn't have big old baggy troughs sitting right over us, spinning right over us uh, this time. Yeah, no doubt. Year, but, no uh, doubt. We're, <laughs> we're easily in drought mode at this point. Yeah. So it's been, it's been a little unsettled, but you know, and, and, Earlier this year, I would have said we needed rain, but no, we we don't we don't need it anymore. The mosquitoes are having a great time, though. Back to you, Scotty. Thank you for that, Jared. I'm glad you've not been carried away by the mosquitoes. Uh, those are some vicious things. Uh, let's go. Out, let, let's go out to Eric, who is in Memphis, Tennessee, and he's like, "What the heck are you guys talking about, Eric? You guys actually have some nice weather out there." Yeah, and we sent all that stuff off to your direction to let you guys have it for a little while because we got tired of it. But uh, yeah, it's we've had three or four really, really nice days in a row here for for uh, the Deep South um, with dew points in the uh, mid-60s. We really can't complain too much. Um, the In fact, yesterday morning, the uh, airport here, Memphis International, got below 70 for a low for the first time in about six weeks. Um, so we were, we were definitely due for some uh, decent weather. Now everybody's just... Uh, overjoyed at 90 degrees and, and uh, 65 dew point, which we should be just doing every day in my opinion. But uh, yeah, we're going to, we're going to stick with it. And the, uh, the longer term trends do look like it's going to stay uh, except for a day or two here or there, probably uh, below normal for, for temperatures. So we'll definitely take it heading into the end of July and early part of August, which is typically about the hottest time of year here. No complaints from Eric and Memphis. So Eric, thanks for that report. Let's uh, before we go to Janine, Let's go to Shay Gibson and Shay. I'll let you. Uh, I'll give you the floor per se, and uh, we can briefly talk about uh, what's going on in the tropics. Okay, Scotty, thank you very much. Uh, make sure I'm taking off a of mute there, and uh, I'm going to share a screen and um, you know talking about what uh, Jared mentioned, and uh, you know this is that time of the year. So this is our state bird right now until you know probably September, October when when things start to cool off and these go away. Uh, but enough about mosquitoes. Let's go ahead and uh, dive right into the tropics. Nothing to speak of. Everything looks pretty quiet right now. That's good news. Uh, we are expecting at this point, uh, there's a slight tendency to believe that we are going to have a lower than normal uh, or below normal activity for the remainder of the hurricane season. That doesn't mean we're not going to see anything else. We probably will. We're going to see a big up spike in activity come September uh, as we get late August and September. Uh, right now, what we're having, if you can see this map, this is earth.nullschool.net, and these yellows here represent Saharan air dust that is suspended in the mid-levels of the atmosphere and stretching all the way over to Texas. So you can see how um, dry the air is along the intertropical convergent zone. This is the equatorial belt, the monsoonal belt, where tropical storms and hurricanes would normally develop. Uh, and as we get into August, these are the dog days of the summer, and this is where the Cape Verde season starts to come into play when we get into August where this intertropical convergence zone lifts up towards the Cape Verde Islands. And that's when you start to see a higher increase in activity as more of the monsoonal troughs move uh, from Africa into the Atlantic Ocean. And you can see right now there's uh, some potential tropical waves coming uh, just, just below the Saharan dust. There's a little bit of a break right there. And um, we'll see, we'll have to wait and see how these, these pair up. And if you get a lot of this dust over the top of these, these troughs or these uh, tropical waves coming off, it usually disseminates. It usually just dissolves them and they just don't, they don't really um, come to any kind of fruition. So we can thank the dust of the Saharan desert for protecting our coastlines uh, for so many millions of years. And if we look at our surface map, this is WSI surface map, kind of what's going on right now. This is going to be uh, something that we're going to be looking for for the next several cold fronts that drop into the Southeast region. You can see all this activity right now. We had low pressure over the Northeast Gulf states, really lifting up a lot of moisture up along the Eastern seaboard. Now these low pressures are starting to move up the Eastern coast and bring all that moisture up with it. Uh, eventually this will, this front will fizzle and these lows will move out of the picture. Things may dry out for a couple of days and we have another cold front coming. So what we have here is Bermuda high pressure out here in the Atlantic, keeping these fronts from moving out to sea. Uh, so that's why we have this sort of stuck pattern where we're going to get these waves of rain and activity, messy conditions, 
on and off as these fronts stall over our area. And that's that's pretty much it uh, for the tropics as far as some of the um, homegrown systems just off the coastline uh, over our sea surface temps, which are very warm. Uh, we're in the mid 80s, most places on the southeast coast. Uh, so there's good good fueling source for tropical systems, but nothing as of yet. There's just too much motion, too much movement, um, not enough um, offshore activity with low pressures to really um, culminate anything of, of any significance. So I think we're going to be okay for a while. We're, we're not looking at any kind of tropical system, even the GFS out to 384 hours, which, you know, skeptical once you get past even 100 hours. Um, we're not seeing anything popping up. So we're good to go for a while. What? No fantasy storms? Nope. And the wow. GFS always puts them right over Charleston. Anything beyond <laughs> 300 hours, we're getting nailed. But that that never happens. Rarely happens. We're gonna have to. We're gonna have to go to the Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, maybe it'll it'll do a, like a Fujiwara spin up effect and throw something our way, right? You know, we can always hope. Jeez, that's that's kind of scary though when the GFS isn't showing anything. So. Let's go. Uh, let's go into our uh, our talk tonight. We have Dr. Janine Kreibner on with us again. She's a professor at Concord University, and we're talking about volcanoes tonight. So, uh, Miss Janine, uh, welcome to our show. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me on. You're welcome. So, uh, I'll tell you, this is our first show ever about volcanoes. So, uh, as we were uh, corresponding in our emails, I'm I'm ready to learn just as much as everyone else tonight. So, uh, I guess our first question, especially to our first time guest, is to kind of tell us about who you are, how you got um, involved or or interested in, in studying volcanoes, and maybe what your day to day operations are. Yeah, sure. So, I'm a postdoctoral researcher here at Concord. I'm originally from New Zealand. And um, most people, when they hear I'm living in West Virginia, like, why? Is there something wrong? <laughs> but no, we're okay. Um, I study explosive volcanism. So my PhD was in um, pyroclastic flows, which are basically a really hot, really fast racing avalanche of death that race down volcanoes during eruptions. And I also do a lot of communication work on social media and on things like this and working with the media to get the information out correctly because sometimes that can be a life or death situation. So um, at the moment I'm doing research on volcanic ash layers, looking at um, volcanic ash data. And on the side, I'm doing all of this communication stuff. Well, I definitely want us to, to talk about the communication stuff, but we'll kind of save that towards the end of the show. Um, because that correlates with a lot with what, what we do in the meteorology world. Um, tell us about volcanoes. How, how are they formed? Maybe for those folks who maybe have heard about volcanoes in the news or, or, or you know, just don't really know the, the science of them. Tell us about volcanoes and, and just maybe how rare or not rare they are around the world. Yeah, so a volcano is basically a location where magma or magmatic products like gas or ash or pyroclastic flows have come out at some time. And right now there are about 43 eruptions or active periods going on around the world. So that's a lot more than most people think. Um, and it's pretty complicated. Volcanoes are incredibly difficult. Um, you have magma that is rising up from very deep below the surface, changing as, it's go as it goes. Once it starts getting shallow enough, it starts releasing gases. Um, we, can, we can actually monitor those as well. And then once you're getting shallower again, it starts producing earthquakes and releasing different kinds of gases. And then eventually, but not always, that can erupt as a, um, an eruption, a volcanic eruption like lava or pyroclastic flows, whether it's explosive or effusive. Um, or it can just have ash, small puffs of ash, or really large puffs of ash. In fact, some of the larger ones have gone from places like Alaska all the way to Europe. So there's a huge range of activity, and volcanoes are pretty bad at telling us what they're about to do. <laughs> so a lot of work goes into trying to forecast what the heck is going to happen. Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Um, Shay, did you have something? Nope, I was just queuing you, and if not, I would, I would. I didn't know if you were having some technical difficulty. Or I was gonna have to carry that forward, Scotty. So no, you, you. you know, I've done this for almost five years now, and I still have problems muting and unmuting myself. So, um, you're you're talking about those active volcanoes. Um, you know, there are potentially 169 uh, active volcano centers around the United States. 
Um, where are they most commonly? And um, maybe the biggest one that we've all heard about recently has been the one in Hawaii. So maybe you can kind of talk to us a little bit about that. Maybe, you know, the hot zones for the United States or, or the North America continent and, and where we can normally see them. Yeah, so you have the Cascades Range in Oregon and Washington, and then there are volcanoes that continue all the way down through California as well. Um, Alaska has a whole bunch of volcanoes. Usually there's at least one or two producing activity in Alaska. We have Kilauea, which has been um, erupting for over 30 years now, but recently there's been a change in activity where there is a huge amount of lava that's coming out. Um, that's unfortunately destroyed over 700 homes is the last number I saw. So a lot of people being displaced from that. Um, and then uh, continental USA, we also have the very famous Yellowstone, of course, <laughs> which is usually the one people are worried about. But um, I would be worried more about the Cascades volcanoes personally than Yellowstone any day. So you talk about Yellowstone, and I know uh, there was an article out uh, that was released today by the National, Ge uh, National Geography. National Geographic, excuse me, I got my tongue tied there, uh, talking about uh, Yellowstone. So give us the, let's, let's get the real information. Tell us why we shouldn't really worry about Yellowstone and the fearful of these huge super volcano or something that we've been hearing about. Yeah, so the term supervolcano in itself causes a lot of trouble because it, when people think supervolcano, they think, okay, well, super is the only thing that this volcano does. But a supervolcano is only a volcano that is capable of producing these really large um, scale eruptions. Now, Yellowstone has produced around three of those in recent history. And by recent, I mean hundreds of thousands of years because we're talking about um, geologic time scales. But much more frequently are just lava flows and steam eruptions. So if Yellowstone was to erupt tomorrow, which it probably won't because we've seen no signal like that at all, um, it would be a lava flow or a steam eruption. Those are the most likely scenarios. But if, um, of course, the massive, big, what we call VEI-8 or caldera forming eruptions are really flashy, so they get in the tabloids, so they get a lot more attention. But you have a more dangerous volcano in the States, and that is Rainier over by the Seattle-Tacoma area. So the reason that rainy year of a concern is because you see all that ice there, all of those glaciers, all of the snow, even a very small eruption could produce catastrophic lahars or um, mud flows, volcanic mud flows. And these have been over 100 meters deep in places in the past, and they've gone all the way out to the ocean. So extremely dangerous. You don't need an eruption to produce one of these. Some of the biggest ones were formed when parts of the volcano has collapsed. It's basically a very rotted volcano, so there are a lot of areas of weakness. So that's a much more dangerous situation. And what type of volcano is this exactly? Uh, it's what we'd call a composite volcano, but the it's not too much of a useful term because even within composite volcanoes, which most of the Cascades volcanoes are, not all of them, uh, they all have their own personalities or eruption styles. So we've seen what Mount St. Helens can do, um, big ash eruptions and then growing these volcanic domes, which is thick lava that comes out into the crater and that can be quite explosive. Um, Mount Hood produces lava domes and pyroclastic flows. So there's big hot avalanches um, that can destroy everything in their path. And Rainier produces these massive lahars, um, even from small eruptions. So they all have their own personalities. They're all different. So it's really important to know the, the past and the history of a specific volcano to try and understand what it might do next. So we're not, Mount Rainier, that, we're not looking at that one being a, a blowout like Mount St. Helens, are we? Probably not. <laughs> but... Um, the reason Mount St. Helens did that was because magma had actually risen up into the volcano and it was bulging out towards the north and then there was a big landslide. That landslide can happen at Rainier, but to have that massive lateral blast or um, that huge ash plume pyroclastic flows kind of scenario we saw in Mount St. Helens in 1980, the magma has to be right there. So that was a combination of those two things. Uh, now, Dr. Krabner, you, you talked about just a little bit earlier 
Uh, we can kind of parlay this into the weather world per se. He said sometimes they're kind of hard to predict what they're going to do. We can we can coordinate that into the weather world with, with us talking about maybe potential winter storms or hurricanes. What what makes them so tricky sometimes to kind of predict what's going to happen? Well, first of all, we can't see the magma. <laughs> so that's pretty tricky. And the magma can be kilometers below the surface and we can't see what it's doing. So it's, it's constantly changing. It can be growing crystals, which changes the way it behaves. It can be releasing gases, which changes the way it behaves. It can be forming bubbles, which changes the way it behaves. It can move through different kinds of rock, which can change everything. And um, more magma can come up below it, which can kind of recharge it. And it, this could all look like it's about to erupt and then just stop. So it can have um, activity that goes up and down and up and down for days, weeks, or even months, and then lead to an eruption or go back to sleep. So it's pretty complicated. And we have so many different monitoring tools, and you have to use all of them together to try and forecast what the volcano might do. We don't, we don't predict eruptions. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to follow up on that. I was actually going to ask a, a question about the monitoring. And, and first of all, I'll say I've got a, a good friend who's leaving the Memphis area on Friday to go out to Yellowstone. And so I'm glad to hear nothing is imminent um, for his next 10 days uh, while he's out there. But um, as far as the, as the monitoring, so all of the, the volcanoes that we're aware of that could pose an issue, I guess, are, are being actively monitored. What what types of monitoring is done and what what is being looked for? Is it just is it just earthquakes that might predict something like that or what other things are could help in that prediction? Yeah, um, well, first off, not all the volcanoes that need to be significantly monitored are. That takes funding. Um, but when you do have a really good monitoring system, um, you usually have size, seismometers, which is picking up the earthquakes. So it's not just the number of the earthquakes, but you can look at the depth of the earthquakes, the amount of energy they're releasing, what type of earthquakes they are, depending on if it's rock breaking because the magma is wedging its way up or if it's gas or fluids. Um, looking at the gas emissions is the next really big one, I would think. Um, that's looking at the types and the amounts of gas that is being released, and that changes as the magma is coming up. But you do get some cases like um, at Mount St. Helens where the volcano is quite wet. So volcanoes are very porous, they can hold a lot of water, and that can actually scrub out the gases. So um, that can be difficult. Uh, deformation is a really important one as well. So like with Mount St. Helens in 1980, the physical um, size or shape of the volcano actually changed, and you can measure that. Uh, thermal anomalies, or when you have magma coming or heat coming to the surface, you can measure those either on the volcano or from space as well. And most of these you can also monitor from space, not the earthquakes. Um, you can look at infrasound, which is pressure waves going through the air. You can look at the chemistry of the fluids that are coming off the volcano and the amount of um, fluids that are coming off the volcano as well. And then looking for other things like other avalanches that are occurring because of the these changes. So I'm um, kind of a, not to, not to take away from you, I just wanted to ask you a quick question to get all this information. It, you know, us in the meteorology field, we have lots of sensors. We have, we have, buoy data, we have all kinds of data points. Uh, do you have that as well? I mean, do you have a, a vast array of, of equipment that you can use to monitor what, what type of activities are ongoing, what kind of gases are being emitted? Yeah, the volcano observatories usually use quite a number of different techniques on a single volcano, especially if it's becoming more active. But that's the best case scenario. So volcanoes usually give us some kind of warning, usually, not always before they erupt. But if you don't have the funding to properly monitor a volcano, you're not going to pick those up. But ideally, you'd have a whole range of instruments pointed at or on a volcano so you can pick these different signals up and put all of those together. And it's it's really complicated. Each one of those different monitoring techniques takes a huge amount of specialized knowledge. Is that um, a lot of that data coming from like funded sources like the USGS or, or uh, is there is there like one particular like entity or authority that, that sort of says, okay, we, we have all this equipment we're going to put on Mount Rainier, for instance, or Yellowstone, and we're going we're gonna to go in-depth study or even like Mount Arenal in Costa Rica or something like that? Uh, for the United States, the authority is USGS. They do um, pretty much all of the monitoring work. They do work with some partners to do that as well. And with eruptions like at Kilauea, they do get other people from universities coming in to help with different things too. But USGS is the monitoring um, 
institution for the states. In fact, there's the Alaska Volcano Observatory, the California Volcano Observatory, the Cascades Volcano Observatory, and the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. So there's a few of them there. But most countries or regions have their own um, observatory or observatory system. So Indonesia has around 150 active volcanoes. <laughs> so they have quite a few different locations or observatories throughout that country. So, so Dr. Krabner, you, you know, we were talking about Kilauea, you know, it, it kind of just sparked up. Can, can you kind of give us like a, maybe kind of like a timeline of what, what maybe you guys seen before it spiked up or was, you know, I know you said it's kind of hard to predict sometimes, but was there signs that, hey, this activity may start to spark up or, or how, how was that timeline? Yeah, USGS did an incredible job. The Hawaiian Volcano Observatory um, actually put out notices days leading to the fissures starting to open, saying that there was an increase in activity heading down that east rift zone. So they were monitoring magma movement. They just could not tell exactly where or exactly when that was going to come up. And that's because of this constantly changing system. And it's also a very active area that's actually very slowly rifting apart, not catastrophically, but there are more easier gateways for the magma to get to the surface. So um, they did a great job giving warning with what you can do with a volcano. They also gave warning um, leading up to the more explosive ash eruptions at the summit. Uh, they gave warning before the eruption turned a lot more voluminous and um, with much bigger lava flows. So they've done an amazing job monitoring this volcano. And what sort of, um, like when you get an eruption like that and a fissure opens in basically someone's backyard and, and, and you know, takes out a street in a neighborhood and, and folks are like, why didn't we know that? I mean, of course you can't know when something like this is going to happen. So how do you deal with that on the public aspect? Like when you're addressing it in, in Twitter and Facebook and whatever, USGS, we see them pop up all around. Um, when you're talking with munis municipalities or cities and states about what happened, um, what's the word that you want to get to the public about, you know, things that just happen like this? Um, I'm not sure about the official word with the municipalities. USGS has been doing all of that, um, which is a huge job. But um, I think it's definitely important that people know that Kilauea is a very active volcano. In fact, 90% of the surface of this big volcano is less than 1,000 years old. But when people started um, developing that area, they didn't know that. They, um, at the time the activity was up at the summit, they did not know that this area was so active. So they started building homes and communities there um, without that knowledge in the beginning. But um, it's a big volcano. You can't tell where the next eruption is gonna pop up and there are areas that have been living there perfectly fine this whole time without being affected by eruptions. And that's spawned over what, what are called hot spots. So tell us a little bit about hot spots. Um, you know, we hear that word frequently, but what does that actually mean? I mean, is Hawaii growing as a result of that? Or, is, you know, uh, tell, us, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so most volcanoes are formed over subduction zones. So that's when you have um, a one slab or tectonic plate going down underneath the other. But that's not what Kilauea or the Hawaiian Islands are at all. Um, that's an, uh, kind of an area of extremely high heat flow. So that's melting a lot of rock or producing a lot of magma below that volcano. And the tectonic plates are moving over top of that, which is producing a chain or a line of these volcanoes. So there's multiple volcanoes on the big island of Hawaii and Kilauea is one of the most active. And I didn't know if, uh, Scotty, if you want to, Yep. I didn't know if anybody else had any questions. I was trying to, to research the country and I, I just can't, can't find it. We had another major eruption that happened recently and the country just slips my mind. So Dr. Krabner, I'm sure you know, uh, you know, the country. Can you tell us about, about it? Because it was pretty major as well. And um, you mean the one in Guatemala with the, yes. yeah. Um, yeah, that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got you covered. It's okay. That's why you have me here. Right. Um, there was, as someone, I, you know, I did not see your question earlier. So I got um, involved. I, I fell in love with volcanoes when I was a little kid. I don't remember not loving volcanoes. And when it was when I was 13 that I decided that I was a volcanologist. By decided, I mean, I realized it was a real thing. And from that moment on, I knew I wanted to study pyroclastic flows, um, which I still am. So to see 
Fuego volcano in Guatemala produced pyroclastic flows which have killed hundreds, potentially over a thousand or up to two thousand. I've seen some estimates. People is absolutely gut wrenching. Um, when I first, I was actually watching this um, situation progress online, and I just felt sick watching it. Um, it's it's horrific. It's horrendous. This is a, again a very active volcano. Um, the volcano is frequently producing activity and every while it has these larger eruptions which we call paroxysms and when this eruption started it looked like just another one of these larger eruptions and by the time we realized how big it was it was too late. I think Chris had a question. Go ahead Chris. Hey doc uh, I was just curious so uh, especially something that we can uh, correlate in the weather world you know, uh, the 1991 Mount Pinatubo eruption, how it caused a, uh, you know, global cooling of the earth, uh, you know, for a year or two after the explosion or after the uh, eruption, how often is, do, do eruptions like that happen? And, uh, you know, what causes it? Not that often. Um, and it's usually one of the first things people go to as a concern these days when there's an eruption. But there are several things that have to happen. First of all, the, the eruption has to be big enough to actually inject ash and gas high enough into the atmosphere. And it has to, be, and has to be enough gas high in the atmosphere to actually circulate the Earth, and then that can cause a cooling effect. But this can be influenced by the latitude, so whether it's at, um, closer to the poles or the tropics um, will de depend on how easily that can circulate around the globe. And then also the season. So whether it's a northern hemisphere summer where the more land mass is getting more heat, that can influence it as well. So while it definitely has, um, it does look like it has produced significant climate effects in the past, it's relatively rare that it does. And when it does, it's usually only for a few years. Awesome. Thank you. That's something I've been curious about personally for a long time. <laughs> oh, that's a good point, Chris. I was going to actually add, ask about that at some point. Might as well talk about it now about the weather that these volcanoes create. And the, the one thing I always think about is pyrocumulus cla uh, clouding, even, um, you know, pyroclastic clouding. It's just, it's an immense amount of heat thrown into the atmosphere and you end up getting these, these large plumes. You can see where the equilibrium level was met here and it's spreading once it reaches that, that cool level. But even you get lightning, you get um, all kinds of interesting things just from the heat and the, and the electricity buildup from that release into the atmosphere. So tell us um, maybe a little bit about what you know, um, what happens with the weather over volcanoes. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. We've seen some pyrenumulus um, clouds over the lava flows in Kilauea recently because of that extreme heat. Uh, with those really big ash eruptions like the ones you just saw then, we have that huge, th we have thrusting of ash and rock and volcanic ash is essentially rock, glass and ash. So it's solid stuff. And that gets to a point of neutral buoyancy, which then it starts to spread out. Um, so you can see quite a lot of lightning with that as well. Um, in 1991, the Pinatuba eruption you mentioned, that actually happened to coincide with a typhoon. <laughs> so that was pretty bad news. That made the eruption situation much worse. Um, even small eruptions can have lightning just at the vent as well. But this is pretty cool stuff, and it's a relatively new area of monitoring where with these larger eruptions, if you can't see it, so if it's at nighttime or if it's cloudy, you can monitor the lightning strikes as they're moving. And you can also um, pick up if there, are, if there are eruptions happening at more remote volcanoes, which might not have any people around, but are pretty hazardous to aircraft. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say that Reykjavik, Iceland, when they had that eruption and it, it affected the economy, the airflow over Europe, parts of Europe and England, they couldn't fly out. They had to close down airports because the uh, the ash flow had just had spread over the area. So there's there's a lot of weather tied in with this too, as far as movement of of all the ash and everything involved with it. It, it really can be a problem. Yeah, trying to forecast where the ash might go depending on um, how high it's gone in the atmosphere. So if it's had a jet stream and how much ash has been produced over how long is extremely important. Um, for, especially for airlines. Like, could you imagine if the Icelandic Eifert Lyokra eruption occurred over in California? How much, how many planes would be grounded over the entire United States? It would be a pretty different situation. Yeah, or if Yellowstone I, goes off, Eric, you over at FedEx. 
Yes. Well, I was actually going to jump right in there and I was about to ask the same thing when you uh, when you mentioned it. So my career position is uh, as an aviation meteorologist. And so uh, remember very vividly um, when the Iceland volcano um, blew and how the the airspace was affected. And, you know, you you're talking about uh, grounding aircraft fleets, uh, you know, Euro control shut down a large portion of European airspace, um, you know, for flights uh, like ours that were going between North America and Europe. We were taking the long way straight across the ocean rather than a great circle route, which, you know, would take us typically right over the, the Icelandic area. So the, I, I, and I don't, I don't mean to ask something maybe, uh, maybe you don't have a lot of experience with, but do you, do you have any idea that's one of our biggest kind of challenges is figuring out, you know, right now, volcanic ash is pretty much something that airliners just completely avoid, but there's different, there's different amounts of ash in the air, different concentrations, fallout is not really um, understood real well. Is there, how much research is going into what is safe and what isn't? And is there any hope for the future of being able to, you know, kind of uh, use a little bit more of the airspace that maybe is not affected just because we're not measuring it well enough? Yeah, um, good question. There's been, I'm sure you can imagine, a ton of research that's been done since that eruption. And it's not only research into how can we better monitor these ash plumes. So by monitoring an ash plume, you're either looking from the ground or looking from a satellite in space, trying to figure out the particle sizes of the ash and how much ash is in a plume, which, you know, it's, it's no easy feat because there are a lot of other things like water vapor in the air you have to take into account. Um, so there's also been research done to look at how much ash an air engine can actually take. I think someone, I can't remember who, actually flew a plane through an ash plume. Um, so it's, it's some really neat stuff that's been going on. But you really don't want to be stuck in a good enough, you know, decent enough ash plume, which can shut the engine down in completely. But most engines that have been shut down, in fact, all of them, I think, no plane has crashed from an ash plume, <laughs> they've all got the engines going again. Yeah, it'd be someone with a very large life insurance policy that actually flew through to measure <laughs> how much ash was uh, was going into their engines. I, I wouldn't want to be the one to do that. Um, Jared, maybe you want to follow up on the on the satellite detection of that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we've got these great new satellites going up. We have goes our series. We have uh, Himari Eight uh, that's helping out over Hawaii and. You know, still good old trusty Ghost 15. Looking over some um, some of uh, Wisconsin's uh, on their satellite blog, they have some really cool uh, infrared and uh, shortwave imagery uh, that they use to track that. So, how are you using weather satellite data, uh, possibly in your studies, and um, and how you position communications and things of that nature? Um, I have looked, I have used satellite data. My PhD was also in remote sensing, uh, but it wasn't looking at ash plumes. But uh, the ASTIS sensor is a really good one for that kind of stuff. The thermal infrared bands are really helpful. Um, shortwave infrared is helpful if you're looking at an actual volcano putting out a lot of heat, but the thermal bands are really useful for looking at um, not only the actual ash, but the gases and the plumes too, which can help you track the ash. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know that uh, Go16, um, one of the derived products that comes out of it is uh, they, they have derived volcano products. So it's going to be interesting to see how those translate into operations as time goes on. Yeah, hopefully, definitely. Hopefully they... There are a lot of really neat models. Well, not a lot, but a few really good models that are looking at um, incorporating weather data and all that kind of stuff as well to try and figure out where these might go in advance. And then... At the time, looking at current weather patterns to try and figure out where exactly areas might be affected by these. Well, Dr. Kreibner, uh, we've been talking a lot about volcanoes, um, but also some of uh, what you do is kind of prepping people for volcanoes. You know, what, what you should do if you live in an area that's prone to those. Uh, good communication, bad communication. That kind of leads into the next part of our show where... Uh, next part of the segment, uh, Bernie, Bernie Sap Sambo, I think he's one of your friends, Shay, uh, is watching tonight. And he was talking about seeing uh, on a few TV programs regarding the big one uh, that's looming under Yellowstone Park. Um, how much do we see maybe on TV shows or tabloids? How much is that fact versus fiction? Well, I mean, kind of how, how can we figure out the good stuff uh, from the bad stuff? Well, if they're using terms like the big one, it's probably bad. <laughs> if they have all caps words like gonna blow or panic or anything, it's usually complete, complete bull. Um, but 
honestly, if, if, the, if anyone is saying that something is about to happen at Yellowstone, look at USGS. They're putting updates on about this volcano. As soon as there's an increase in um, an activity and not an eruption, in seismicity or gas output or geyser activity, they're reporting it. That's how people that are doing these conspiracy theory type things are getting their data to begin with. Um, and then, of course, there are a couple of tabloids which are particularly horrible, um, even going as far as saying that an eruption at Yellowstone is imminent, which is based on nothing at all. In fact, last week there was a crack in a rock in the next park over, and people were saying that an eruption was imminent at Yellowstone. It was a, it was a crack in a rock. <laughs> <laughs> that add that to, to like documentary specials where they they come on and say you know this is the real problem and they show water runoff in certain areas and the bulging of land and super volcano and um which leads to a, a kind of a similar question from another um another uh, one in our audience francis tubalino i think i pronounced that right uh, i have often heard that the closer a volcano is to the equator if eruption occurs to spew ash to the sky the better chance it has to affect or cause global cooling what is your thought on this and I think we were talking a little bit about that earlier about globe, do they cause global warming? Um, they can't, you, she's right. Um, closer to the tropics does have more an effect because you get that bit of circulation. Um, I, that's not my specialty area, by the way. Um, but it does cause cooling, but usually only for a year or two if it does. And even if it is in that um, zone where it can have more of an effect, it has to be big enough and it has to have enough gas. And some volcanoes are more prone to that than others. So it, as with everything in volcanology, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> well, that kind of ties in with, with uh, weather and, and what we do with meteor as meteorologists, you know, trying to inform people of the good information because there is good information, but there's also that bad information. And another thing that we do in meteorology that you guys uh, also do in your field is talking about being prepared. Now, obviously, not a lot of folks, I would say, maybe in our region, the southeast, probably have never even really thought about volcanoes. But if you do find yourself in an area that um, that has volcanic activity, or 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 maybe friends or family, how how can people prepare? What what should they do? What is that? What is what is what do you tell folks who uh, who ask you about being prepared for a volcano? The first thing is to know where to get the right information. So contrary to some people's belief, as volcanologists, it's actually our goal to get the right information out to people at the right time. So we're not, we don't believe that people are going to mass panic. We know that the research has said that that's not what people do. In fact, it's much harder to get people to act. So if something is happening or potentially about to happen, volcanologists, especially the local volcano observatory, so in the US, that is USGS, they are the number one source for information for this country, they'll be giving out information. Um, and the reason that's important is because the right preparedness information depends on the volcano. So for Kilauea, that's lava flows and gas, and um, you have the VOG in that and the lays, um, and also potential explosions like we saw in the ocean last week. And for a volcano like Rainier, that is the Lahaz. So knowing what the sirens sound like to get the heck out of there as soon as you hear those and evacuate, like getting out is the only way to be okay. And then volcanoes like Mount St. Helens or Mount Baker where you have, might have more ash eruptions. So knowing where to get the information and which volcano has which hazards is really, really important. That That's good information. And, and talking about... You know, you're talking about USGS. Obviously, yourself, I mean, uh, you give out good information. Is there other places or, or any recommendations of who people can follow to to get that good information and kind of weed out the bad information? Um, there are a number of volcanologists on social media which give out very good information. Um, Simon Khan does some amazing um stuff with monitoring using satellite data, so looking at um, gas and ash plumes. Uh, there's the VAX, the Volcano Ash Advisory Centers, which give out ash plume information. Um, like at, in real time, they'll give updates. Uh, they'll, they're also on Twitter too. But um, really for the states, USGS is the number one source to go to because they have all the monitoring equipment, they have all the expertise, they have all the background knowledge for that specific volcano, and they are dedicated to helping people. Yeah, I'm showing the, the Twitter account right here. There's actually USGS Volcanoes, and so this is a, a 
legitimate source of information right here, and they have all kinds of uh, ongoing activity all around. Uh, Lace on Hawaii scans, all kinds of really neat things. So if you haven't seen it on Twitter, check them out. They're, they've got a, a lot going on. Yeah, um, and there's um, a there's an actual dedicated uh, account for the Alaskan volcanoes, just because there's so much activity up there as well. But USGS volcanoes covers everything else. Okay, last question for me. <laughs> is this possible? <laughs> Volcano in LA, could that happen? <laughs> um, it's, I mean, there are volcanoes in California. Uh, they don't look like that when they erupt. But uh, California does have volcanoes. In fact, they have enough volcanoes that they have their own dedicated California Volcano Observatory. So um, whether or not they could actually happen in LA, um, that's, I don't think there are volcanoes in that area. I haven't done much research in that area myself. Um, but no. That photo, that photo right there, no. <laughs> We, we were talking about movies before we uh, before we came on, and as a volcanologist, which one would you tell people is a little bit more true, Volcano or Dante's Peak? Dante's Peak for the win, guys. <laughs> Dante's Peak. The pyroclastic yeah. flow is fantastic. The lava flow should not be there. Grandma and Acid Lake, really, really bad. <laughs> but the pyroclastic so, flow, the eruption scene is spot on. You told me it was a twister. Uh, and meteorology is the twister of your science. Is that yes. correct? Yeah. <laughs> so volcano is more like Sharknado then, right? Uh, uh, no, uh, there are other vo volcano movies that are more like Sharknado. Okay. <laughs> it's getting down towards Sharknado. <laughs> I just, I just love the cast in Sharknado. Everyone that you want to get it gets it. You know. <laughs> oh gosh. Um, Can you guys um, do like a communication hazard spin during Shark Week with that? Yeah, we could. We'll, we'll put Jared on that. Jared, that's your responsibility. I'll, I'll be on the wind forecast. We'll talk about aerodynamics, okay? Up shocks and later. Yes, and how fast some fly that. faster than others, and they have a better cutting. We, uh, we just want to know, watching, actually, James is, is showing some of the, the trailer of Volcano. We just want to know if the fire trucks can actually put out the lava flow that's coming towards them. No. <laughs> No, no. <laughs> so if you think of the temperature of water versus the temperature of the thousand degree Celsius lava, um, <laughs> no. Um, but also you have in an eruption where you have lava flows, the lava is just going to keep pumping out from the crater um, and there's no stopping that. So um, it, there have been cases where people have tried to divert lava, like um, in Iceland, um, in Hawaii in the past, and on Etna volcano. But when it does actually work, it's a, well, was the volcano going to stop anyway? So, you mostly no. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Krabner, we've really enjoyed having you on. It's a little bit past 9 o'clock. Um, for those folks who are watching tonight or maybe uh, who are listening on the podcast later on, if, if folks have questions about volcanoes or if they just kind of want to monitor um, information, how can they follow you? What's the best ways to, uh, to follow you? Uh, Twitter is the best way. So just at Janine Krippner. I was not <laughs> creative with my handle at all. <laughs> but um, I'm trying to focus more on getting more information about different volcanoes that are erupting around the world at the moment since there's been a little pushback with people not believing that the current amount of activity is normal, which it is. You know, everybody wants to buy those big headlines. We, we face that here in the weather world all the time. Well, we are going to do a segment called Tweet of the Week. And I, I, I didn't mention it to you, and I don't think Shay did either. Uh, but this is where we kind of scroll through Twitter, and we kind of feature a uh, tweet that we found fascinating. Uh, it could do with weather, volcanoes, however. So if you want to participate in that, uh, we'd love for you to do that. Uh, but I do believe uh, some folks already have theirs pulled up. So uh, James or Jared, I'll let you guys figure out who wants to go first. That's why uh, we get Tweets of the Week going. I think Jared had one more question too, didn't he? Oh no! I just uh, I'm just fast on the draw with a tweet, but no, it was uh that was that was fantastic information. Um, and kind of a, we're all used to uh you know the the bad the bad fake news on volcanoes, so we really appreciate all the real news that you spread. 
uh, Dr. Kurtner. That's awesome. So I've uh, been a spouty few days here um, in the Charleston area around uh, the uh, around the Esto uh, Island area. So here's the water spout from yesterday. Um, not at 7.25 a.m. I, I'm logged out of Twitter for some reason, so it's on Pacific time. This was uh, just, a, just a little before uh, 10.30 yesterday. Um, several pictures of this came around, and we weren't quite sure if it was really happening at the at the in real time, but it was so, you know, water spouts coming ashore in this onshore flow, um, very near shore. Uh, we may have, I, something tells me that we'll probably have somebody who has, uh, the Myrtle beach one, uh, one came ashore at Myrtle beach and that wasn't good because people were just sitting there staring at it. Uh, not, not always great, but this one comes from, uh, the Edisto golf maintenance department, Edisto golf super on Twitter. And yeah, really good looking, a uh, really sharp little funnel cloud there. So, um, you know, water spouts can't detect them on radar, need spotter reports. And this is, uh, and it was very helpful to have this, um, because, um, we were able to get that triangulated with a few other sources. Shay was in integral in that. And we got a, a nice report into the national weather service around that. So, um, thank you very much for all of your photos of these water spouts. And I'm jealous because I didn't see it in person. Yeah. We always say here in Charleston area and anywhere along the coast, if, uh, share your pictures of these these help greatly with forecasting efforts for all the national weather service offices all you got to do is let any of the local meteorologists know and we'll get it there um if they don't have it already we'll get it there it goes in their local storm reports and uh it helps with their efforts to to uh, distinguish time slots for the water spouts to happen and it puts together a nice piece of the puzzle for them so make sure you note the time the location and any existing conditions and just let us know and you can let any of us on the panel know. We'll get it to the right hands. Definitely. So, and Jared, you mentioned the Myrtle Beach um, water spout slash tornado. And a lot of people really were criticizing those folks. And, yes, they should have went inside and in, in, in salt shelter. But that had to be fascinating, seeing that coming towards you. I just wonder if, if people were kind of caught up in the moment of, of this mm -hmm. odd thing coming to them, And maybe that's why they didn't run to shelter look let's be honest i would have stayed there too i mean i, mean, I would have i would have yeah oh i'd be i i'd be i would be the the people that are you know screaming at the idiots out you're right the the, the quote-unquote idiots like no i would be one of those idiots so I, I i i have no room to judge here because yeah, that's pretty cool I, I know they there was a lot of slap flack being given and i mean yes they should have went inside but it would have been i would have probably been out there just to say just say, man, that's. I'm trying to say. trying to get this over to the point to the part where it comes up on the beach. So, you know, the big question is everybody's just kind of standing around. I mean, you see a few people packing up and, and getting out. They don't know what it's going to do. But it doesn't look that harmful. Um, and as we go forward into time, this thing starts to actually come towards the coastline. The lifeguards start blowing their whistles. The police start sounding their sirens, and uh, they're thinking at this point this could be a bad situation. But still, nobody's moving. The big thing here is these umbrellas and beach equipment make for dangerous weapons in this kind of a situation when these things run ashore because they may seem light. And when they get onto the beach, they could be in excess of 60 miles an hour. Put that in an umbrella and you could be a shish kebab pretty quick. Right. Yeah, I I agree with that. And, um, you, you know, for those folks who may have not who may have never been to Myrtle Beach or maybe you've been there but not kind of familiar with it, this actually came on shore like, at the strip this is where the pavilion used to be right now it's like a grassy area where they do concerts and volleyball so this was literally downtown the strip of myrtle beach where this happened so amazing stuff there yeah said it dragged a person too so um yeah not uh not not the uh, yeah you know it's it's hard you know because i guess most people don't know where it's gonna come on shore and if it really is gonna happen but uh, yeah, it's sketchy stuff, man. Definitely. So Shay, was that your tweet of the week? I, I, I didn't know if you were wanting to use that or if you um, had something else. Nope. I have something real quick. I can, okay. I can throw up here. Um, okay. This, this came um, actually today, this afternoon over um, Isle of Youth over uh, Cuba. And um, basically what this is, is a lot of these islands in the, in the Caribbean, they have sea breezes just like we do on the, on the coast of the United States. And the difference is, is that they have higher terrain. So whereas here along the coastal plain of the Carolinas, we see a, a real gradual sea breeze that sort of propagates and when it just kind of hangs out. Well, these sea breezes travel upslope 
and then they collide. And you can see here the explosion it makes. It looks like a, like in a volcanic eruption. So that's why I picked it for tonight because it looks kind of like one, uh, you know, from a satellite view. But it's not really what that is. It's just a blow up of a very large thunderstorm as these sea breeze fronts converge, and then it it just basically dissipates all of its energy at one time. You can see gust fronts traveling in a circular direction in all directions. So pretty neat uh, little tweet of the week. I love those little things in those islands down there. Cuba's fascinating to watch in the summertime. All right, thank you for that, Shay. We'll go to Eric. Do you have one, Eric? Yes, I do. All right, so here's from uh, Weather Service Memphis who has been on top of their game lately with uh, fascinating tweets. And this one, if you look real closely, downtown Memphis is right in the middle. There's a, uh, the bridge that goes across the uh, Mississippi River and right along the bridge, just north of the bridge, there's a bright white light that spots that comes up on one minute satellite imagery. And their question was, the skies are clear, what is that? And I know you guys probably won't figure it out if you don't know the, uh, what we've got around the Memphis area and downtown. But let me give you a look from the ground. Was that fire? Oh, no, it wasn't fire. You see that bright light in the middle? That is actually our Bass Pro Pyramid. <laughs> It's stainless steel on the outside, and uh, it was reflecting the sunlight, which makes it look like that when you take it from uh, one of the tall buildings in East Memphis looking towards downtown. But it was actually showing up on Go, uh, Go's uh, satellite as a what looks like a little fire or something popping up there, but it's actually reflection off of a giant building downtown. How cool. That's cool. That's probably just for a certain period of time, too, because the azimuth of the sun changes as time goes on. So you get yep. different reflections in different areas. That's really cool. And that that picture right there was actually taken a few hours after the satellite image when it had when it wasn't showing up on the satellite image anymore. So you can see kind of what caused it. But it was the direction that the sun was um, was reflecting off of it back to the satellite. And uh, I guess it's I'm going to start looking for it because I understand it's not all that rare to see that when we've got clear skies here. How fascinating that is! Go sixteen just keeps amazing me. That is that is for cool. the win. For the win. That's cool. Uh, James, I think you had one, so I'll let you go next. Uh oh, we can't hear you, James. Yeah, James may not because he's working his magic in the background. He may not be able to actually present because his computer is overloaded. Well, he's got his tweet up. It says uh, his aunt was on this plane, took off from Charlotte just in time. I'm going to guess it's a little rocky up there. So it must be talking about the storms that we're moving through the Charlotte area. And, uh, yes. Chris, I think you guys, you and James, are actually having a convo in our in our regular chat that we talked through all the week about this. Yeah, that was last night. That was, uh, you know, right as those uh, storms developed part of the Charlotte area. I made a joke to him, you know, most of the planes that leave out of Charlotte hadn't you know, down towards central Florida, fly right over Columbia. I made a little joke. I'll take a picture for you when she flies <laughs> over Columbia. <laughs> uh, do you have a Do you have a tweet of the week? No, I don't. I need. I actually need to get on the ball with that. You know, just joining you guys and everything oh. that's happened the last couple of days. We, we were slackers. We forgot to tell you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll take the blame on that. Um, I've I've got my tweet up. Let's see. Let's get it. This is um. This is from the Marshalltown. You don't want to see that, do you? Uh, this is from the Marshalltown, Iowa tornado that um, was, I think, last week, last Thursday, Friday, maybe. Uh, but we talk about always having a plan and going to your safe shelter, wearing those helmets and goggles and stuff if you're ever in a tornado warning. And this is why. This is uh, uh, pieces of wood that's pierced this Toyota uh, vehicle on the front uh, from the winds. And I believe it was maybe an EF3 tornado. I think is what I saw. I may be wrong on that, but uh, it just shows you that during these tornadoes, uh, small projectiles can do a lot of damage. Uh, so this uh, this wood was was pierced through the front of a tornado. So um, definitely um, want to make sure that if a tornado is heading towards you, or if you're under a warning, make sure you take those safety precautions, including a helmet and goggles, because um, there's a lot of flying projectiles in tornadoes. All right, Miss Janine, do you have a uh, tweet? I do. All right. So this is your sort of volcano in Vanuatu, so over in the Pacific. And you can see here Tom has got these amazing photos looking down into the crater. So you can see where actual magmatic ma uh, material is coming up with these big bursts of gas, and that is called a Strombolian eruption. 
Um, and some of these are happening all the time. So you can go up and you can um, watch from the creative rim and do some really amazing science from that. So that is mine. How cool is that? That's awesome. Um, so uh, I think, oh, Eric's saying that he has to go away. He can't hear us anymore. We must be having some audio issues. So, uh, but Ms. Janine, thank you so much again for joining us uh, tonight. We, we really enjoyed um, having you here. And maybe uh, we can have you back as a guest to kind of give us an update on, on all these active volcanoes uh, in the next few months. Yeah, sounds good. You guys are a lot of fun. Awesome. Well, we appreciate it. Uh, everyone, thank you for, thanks for watching the Carolina Weather Group tonight. Uh, next week, we don't have a scheduled guest. Um, so we may just kind of uh, have another open table, a round table discussion. But after that, uh, we're going to be talking about um, flood events, uh, volunteers and flood events. Uh, we're going to be talking about derechos. And then we're going to kind of turn our attention to the coast. We're going to have uh, Mark Willis on from Surfline on August 22nd. And Chris Ray and Wesley Shaw on from uh, my coast, which is a unique uh, way to document tides. They're going to be on uh, August 29th. So uh, that's what it looks like for the next few weeks. And as always, we are taking your recommendations or suggestions for topics or guests. So we would love to uh, see those. If you want to send them in, we will do our best to get um, get people uh, booked for the show. And I believe we're only like four or five shows away being from being booked out for the entire years rest of the year so uh the crew has really been hard working and i appreciate that and we hope to um to have all these dates booked up so you don't have to hear us just rambling on because that can go one of many different ways so uh but anyways thanks for watching the carolina weather group tonight we hope you have a great rest of the week enjoy the cooler weather and we'll see you back here next wednesday night for another edition of the carolina weather group have a great weekend